This is the manifold wisdom of God as we gather together. This is what the cross of Christ has achieved. The divine walls that existed between us have been smashed to smithereens through his blood. And this is the manifold wisdom of God. Hello and welcome to Independence, the FIEC podcast. My name is Adrian Reynolds. I'm the head of National Ministries for the FIEC. And I'm joined today by two Scots, Graham Shanks and Rachel Sloan. Hello, Graham. Nice to see you. Hi, Adrian. Good to be with you today. Um, Tell us where you are, Graham, and what you do. Yeah, so I'm coming to you from Brunsfield Evangelical Church. And I'm the pastor there. And Brunsfield is this lovely, leafy suburb of Edinburgh, just south of the city centre. So we've been there for 12 years and it's a lovely place. Great. Thank you. And Rachel is not too far away. Rachel Sloan. Hello, Rachel. Nice to see you. Tell us what you do, Rachel, and where you are. Um, So I work part time um, for the FIC as the director of women's ministry, but I also work part time um, for a church in Edinburgh as well, um, Charlotte Chapel, which is based um, right in the city centre, just off the main kind of shopping street, Princess Street. Um, Great. See the and what do you do there, Rachel, at the church? Um, I'm involved in women's ministry, our young adults ministry, part of the staff team. Great. Well, thank you both for joining us. Um, we're here today to talk about something beautiful. Now, I, I'm just about to go on holiday. I've got, I'm counting down two weeks until my holiday and I'm heading to the mountains, which I'm quite excited about because I do love a mountain. And um, I just thought it'd be interesting to ask you both, um, you know, what what's near you that's a, that's beautiful? If, if, if you've got a favourite local beauty spot, Graham, it seems like an obscure question. It is going to make sense in just a moment. <laughs> I promise you. <laughs> where, where near you is beautiful? I mean, Edinburgh on a good day is is wonderful, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, what, it, what takes your breath away, Graham? Edinburgh is a beautiful city. We love living here. I think our favourite thing about Edinburgh uh, is Arthur's Seat and it's lovely because it is an extinct volcano. So, not- Is that what you like about it most of all? Well, <laughs> <laughs> it offers fantastic views from the top. And I climbed it with our kids recently and they loved it. Uh, it's a windy place, but you get beautiful views of uh, in every direction, really, from, from Edinburgh. So Arthur's Seat would win it for me. Are there any other extinct volcanoes in the UK? I'm not, I'm not aware of any. There we go. It, it, it wins hands down, I think. R- Rachel, what about you? What, what, what's kind of, um, uh, you know, what scores highly for you, Rachel? Uh, well, I'd, look, I'd love the Pentland Hills, which are just on the south side, the outskirts of Edinburgh. Um, I love the fact that you can just drive 15 minutes, 20 minutes away from where I am and then get out into what feels a little bit like a, a mini wilderness um, and the views up there. So you do get some incredible views of Edinburgh, but also quite incredible views um, just of the hills and out kind of south towards like, yeah, the borders lovely. in some love ways. It. Yeah. And I think now, on another um, note... We, we love... Go on, yeah. I was just going to say, I think Edinburgh has two extinct volcanoes because I think the castle is also uh, built what? on a volcanic plug. So there's the fun so, fact. So today. not content, <laughs> not content with one extinct volcano, Edinburgh has to have two. Well, there you go. Um, it's like the Edinburgh Tourist Board are with us. Um, do go and visit if you've not been. And there's two place. good churches to visit as well. Other churches are available. Um, the reason I was asking you about beautiful things is. Um, Everybody loves something beautiful, don't they? You know, whether it's a the beautiful game. I, I, I promise you, as Scots, we're not going to talk about football today. But you know, it might be it might be the beautiful game. It it might be beautiful surroundings. You might appreciate beauty and art and creative things. You know, we we see beauty in all kinds of places, except the one place I think the Bible encourages us to see beauty, which is in the church. We, I, it seems to me that the church is um, is described in with exactly that language, isn't it, Graham? It, it's a it's a beautiful thing, mm. um, the church, the bride of Christ. And yet when we as as those who serve in the church as leaders think about the church, very often we are complainers, we're grumblers, we think about stuff that doesn't work, that we want to fix. I, I don't think beauty is the first word that springs to mind, is it? <laughs> I think that's Maybe a- it is in Brunsfield, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's you. So we, it was funny, we had Taylor Swift in town last weekend and we reminded her. She came to stay, did she, at your place? Or? <laughs> yeah, I tried to get her to come, but she wasn't up for it. Uh, but we reminded ourselves as a church that there was 120 of us, say, as we gathered. And we thought, no, this is the manifold wisdom of God right here. Mm. This, is the great, right. this is the greatest show in town. 
as far as the heavenly places are concerned. So I find that I look out on our congregation every Sunday and I think two things really quickly together. Number one is what a strange group of people. <laughs> I include myself in that. Uh, just in terms of diversity, what brings such an eclectic mix of people together from ages, stages, different countries, different accents, what brings those people together? And that leads you on to the second thing about the local church, which is only God could do this. This yeah. is the manifold yeah. wisdom of God as we gather together. This is what the cross of Christ has achieved. The divine mm. walls that existed between us have been smashed to smithereens through his blood. And this is the manifold wisdom of God. So not just beautiful, but miraculous. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think yeah. we forget that, don't we? Every Sunday. Yeah. And it's great to that's be reminded right. of it. Rachel, were you at Taylor Swift? I was not at Taylor Swift, but I heard most of it from my garden. So Oh well, so like you've got all the there. benefit without well, I mean without people crowd. might argue people might argue, I guess, Rachel, well, Taylor Swift does bring people together from all different kinds of back you know, if you if you'd gone to that well I I went on the tram past the stadium as they were setting it up and I saw people queuing for their goodie bags. And there were all I mean, you know, there was some commonality. Everyone seemed to have a pink cowboy hat on. But there were some differences there. There were people from different ages within within reason and obviously different backgrounds and whatever so you you could argue that is similar to the church could you or, or is the church doing something even more than that rachel oh yeah the church is definitely doing something more than that in the sense of this is a a group of people coming together for life um and to love right, and to okay. care for each other so so what brings taylor swift fans together was well, taylor swift for that three and a half hours that she's playing and then the chances are the people who are there, they're never going to see each other again. They have a kind of great communal experience for those hours that they're watching her. But the rest of the week and actually the rest of their lives, it doesn't really matter who the Taylor Swift fans are in that kind of moment. Um, and yes, you could then have connections. When you meet another Taylor Swift fan, you've got a great in of a conversation where you can talk about this, you know, her great songs and all that stuff. But actually, it's not something that's going to sustain you and help you throughout life in the way that you you know the church family does actually that's the the joy of that coming together of these all sorts of groups of people then continues on in the same way in the rest of the week you know it's not just yeah, for an really hour helpful. or two Thank on a you. sunday morning hmm. and I, I guess you might describe that experience in all kinds of ways you probably wouldn't describe it as beautiful I mean, there's this, there's something about the church, though, that has a beauty about it, isn't it? That's, that's right, isn't it, Graham? That actually you, you, you look out at these people, this motley crew that are collected together, as you said, mm. and actually there's a, there's a beauty about that because of what the Lord is doing. Where, where does the beauty come from, Graham, as we look at the church? Yeah, so the, the beauty comes from the gospel, doesn't it? So the, this is the thing that's, that's united us together. Uh, and it's, it's a wonderful thing that the, the Lord has done. And it, as I say, it's only him that can can do it it's only the gospel that does this and it does more than create a, a happy family you know there's something we're playing at it, it genuinely creates brothers and sisters doesn't it the, the the metaphors that the new testament would would present us with family body church i mean it's 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 wonderful isn't it so that that is where the unity comes from it comes from the gospel it's the one thing we have in common is our faith in in Christ Jesus. That, that's the thing that's brought us together. Yeah, that's helpful. Now, let, let's just talk about what, uh, you know, how that sort of beauty is kind of um, c cuts in, I suppose. And, and one of the things we've, we've all been doing, we've been reading a book by, by Jean Twenge on different generations. And, and I guess one of the, the, the beautiful things about the church is that it draws people together from all kinds of different backgrounds, those who speak different languages, those who have different experiences, those who have grown up in different ways, people who have been Christians many years, people who have been Christians five minutes. Mm. You, know, you, you could cut it lots of different ways. But, but in this podcast, we're, we're focusing especially on people from different generations. And there is something unique there, isn't there, Rachel, just, just in a, as you observe it about the church and how people from different generations are gathered together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you get the the 80 year old um, granny worshiping alongside the 17 year old um, high schooler and then the, you know, the 30 year old mum of two. Um, it's just mm. kind of and then every age and stage in between and the kind of the people who've grown up with 
technology been surrounded by them those who've watched kind of every new form of online kind of technology kind of being developed and it's just a great picture um, of that yeah i i guess graham though we've got to we've got to just um challenge us a little bit in our own hearts and in church life because it would easy to have a be, a be a church which is made up of different uh people from different generations mm. but not be intergenerational you might have the appearance of being intergenerational because the 80 year old granny is standing next to a 17 year old student mm. but it doesn't make you an intergenerational church does it there's something a bit more profound that needs to be going on for that to happen i think that's right and i think that is uh, as members and elders team we reviewed membership recently and thought about how can we make uh, membership meaningful and before it's about structures and decisions at its core it's about embracing the one another language of the new testament isn't it like this this is what it is to be a church family it's to want to enter each other's lives to be each other's greatest cheerleaders when it comes to the our joy and the progress in the faith so i think that one anothering language is something that we need to to really take to heart and it is a challenging invitation isn't it to to be a people who enter each other's lives um so i think it is a lot more we can easily play at this uh if we, if we want but if we want to be a, a a distinct intergenerational church i think that's the call that it makes for us to want to enter each other's lives find out about each other's struggles enter each other's unique circumstances and that way, I think we're beginning to get to more to the core of what it is to take on one another. Mm. I, I think what I've found helpful reading about this and thinking about it is this is um, this is always a challenge. It's, it's always been a challenge to, to work across generations. Um, and I think in in Christian recent Christian history, we've seen that in musical styles, for example, in the way people dress, you know, all kinds of presenting issues. But, but one of the things that um, Twangy says in her book, Rachel, is that the gap is getting larger and growing faster. It's kind of a double whammy, mm. the gap between generations. Do, do, you, do you observe that at Charlotte? Is that, is that, you know, that's her assessment look, on the other side of the Atlantic, looking at, mm. at the world in general. She's not Christian, is she? Um, she's just observing the world in general. Do you, do you think that's what we see in church life, that the, that the gap is, is larger than it has been before you work with young adults and, and others in the church? Do you see that, Rachel? Yeah, I mean, I guess we see it in the world as well as in the church, don't we? And I think it makes sense the more you think about it. Um, 100, 200 years ago, the experiences of the kind of generations were fairly similar. And one of the things she picks up on is how technology and the kind of changes of that have impacted life for people. And so most of kind of your working life as it were family life would have stayed the same for many generations and so actually you could understand what life was like for the, your 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 children and your grandchildren because they used the same things they did the same things but actually what we've seen in the past hundred years is how technology has rapidly changed the pace of life and how we how we eat how we work how we interact with people um, and so that's when you see that generation gap has widened is because the, you know, what the world and how we experience the world has changed for people. So what my grandparents experienced, what my parents experienced, what my nephews experienced, there's just differences within that. And I think that what I guess part of her premise, and I think we do see it, is then that impacts just how you interact with people, how you interact with the world, mm -hmm. how you understand the world. Um, and so... Yeah, you see that within the church as well, when, you know, kind of just things that are important to different generations don't translate in the same way um, or how yeah. they communicate. Like I remember having a conversation with one of our young adults um, pairing her up with a one to one with someone who is a much older generation and telling her just to give the lady a phone. And she was like horrified this idea of phoning someone on the actual telephone um, and just those kind of like little things she'd much rather send her a text message while this older lady was just mm. phoning then we'll make a plan mm. um you know it's a little example yeah. but it's just those kind of translation things that you start to see and i think it has yeah it has got bigger mm. I'd, I'd like to ask you both this question because i guess 
it does make a difference the church size you're in. I, I guess if you're 130, Graham, um, I mean, we're, we're a similar size, tiny bit smaller, um, where I'm an elder, so we're a similar sort of size. Y you are kind of forced into one another's arms a little bit. Um, you know, church life, you, you can look around the room and see everybody at the same time, and, and you probably know people's names and that kind of thing. Um, so I'm, I'm interested to ask you how this kind of intergenerational stuff, what does it look like in practice? And then, Rachel, I'd love, I'd love to ask you the same question, because I, I guess the challenge as you get much larger is that it, it's always tempting to, to, to split people into homogenous groups um, and especially generational groups. And, and how do we how do we fight against that in a way which just, um, you know, rejoices in and and, and benefits from the, the beauty of this this intergenerational work. So, Graham, you first of all. Mm. Yeah, so I, it's a great question. So I, I think size definitely impacts this. So so we would be a, a kind of medium size, 150 to 200 church, and it is a lot easier in that as a staff team, when we meet on a Monday, we review uh, the weekends, but particularly we talk about people who we did see and we didn't see. And it's not often that where somebody slips through the radar uh, in other words, you miss people when they're not there. If I remember a student who came to us a couple of years ago asking her why she stayed. And she just said, because you remembered my name. And I remember thinking it's just so much easier to do on a on a smaller church. Um, it's maybe one of the practical things that we've tried to do as a church family. Um, I know different churches do it differently, but we've not gone towards uh, a particularly student-tailored ministry. We've encouraged our students to get involved in our uh, growth groups and come on a Sunday and serve. Uh, just recognising that, that there's some real benefit in in not splitting off into, into different generations. That seems to have worked. Uh, I, there's some wonderful intergenerational friendships that have come off the back of that. As their growth groups, we review the Sunday sermons. We're just going to talk a bit more about them in our growth groups. and. We try to mix people together for those um, deliberately to, to try and foster that culture in our church. So maybe just a few of the practical things that we've okay. tried. So there's an intentionality about it. It's not just, um, you know, you, you might hope some of these things would happen, but actually there's, there's a recognition, actually, we do have to make an effort to, you know, to try to try and create that sort of environment or, or rather to, to to make the most of that environment that God has created. Let me put it that way. Yeah, absolutely. So how, how can we foster something of that? Yeah, that community that's yeah. already there. Um, there's some practical things that we can do. I think that mixture between organic and organised, I think you kind of want those two things running at the same time. Uh, mm -hmm. All church lunches is another thing that we try and do to encourage that every other month. Again, just to provide that that space for people to, to mingle and mix. We've tried name badge Sundays, another way of trying to okay. do it. <laughs> Lots of little practical things that you can do. Again, it's not... Uh, attaining isn't it is maintaining it is is yeah how can yeah, we do this yeah. this better together so yeah yeah and it's good to remember isn't it that that um that that unity we have in the gospel that that's spiritually given it's not a it's not something that we create we might create mechanisms and ways of making sure we can maximize it and enjoy it and appropriate it but in all those little practical things we're doing we're not denying that actually the that this intergenerational unity comes from the spirit. It's it's not something that we're we're actually creating, is it? Yeah. Um, Rachel, how about you? Because obviously it's difficult. It's different in a larger church, and the pressures will be different. You have to think about things a little bit differently. What have you found is is helpful? I mean, I guess it's the same. It's being intentional and actually just realizing that you have to put structures in place for some of this to happen. Um, and so thinking about you know our young adults ministry. Yeah, we do have a kind of, I guess, a predominantly generational ministry in that sense for 18 to 25s, but we encourage them to, to seek a one-to-one -one and try and pair them up with someone who's uh, outside of that group. Um, we do a kind of home from home scheme where we kind of pair up a group of students or young adults with a family in church so that they can meet them. With our recent women's lunches that we've done, um, we've done a table plan. So again, just being quite intentional where we put people so that, you know, people aren't it's just like into a massive wedding. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. I mean, yeah, but just kind of say, you know, saying to people, the whole point of this lunch is for you to meet other people that you wouldn't normally meet on a Sunday. Um, right. And, right. and I guess some of it comes through church 
culture. Do those things feel a bit forced sometimes, Rachel, or does that does that just not matter? I mean, it can feel a bit, I suppose, but if you if you tell people why you're doing it in that sense, yeah, then okay. I think that helps. So trying to encourage people that, yeah, it feels maybe a bit kind of odd to be forced to sit next to someone that you don't really know. But if you plan it well and kind of, again, mix it up so that there's some people who are similar and some people are different, then it's not quite mm. so um, mm. odd. But I think just, again, the church culture of just encouraging people to talk to people during you know <laughs> when the kids go out during the service or at the end of the service you'll turn to the person next to you at times when you maybe want to encourage people to sit in a different part of the church um mm. you know so some of it comes through intentional what? structures what? i know I have to sit in, not hang on hang seat. on <laughs> i have to sit in a different seat i'm not this is this is going too far <laughs> yeah so so it's, it's it's good to hear so it's a mixture of organic and organized i like that that's a, that's a good way of describing it how, how do you think though rachel just just to push on that a little bit how do we I mean, you were talking about meetups, you know, a, a student goes to a family and all that kind of thing. How do we avoid this being always that that one is a kind of the senior partner in any sort of in, intergenerational relationships? Do you know what I mean by that? That, you, you know, back to your um, back to your 80 year old who's worshipping next to a 17 year old. How do we get away from the concept that actually it's just about the 80 year old? instructing and giving to the 17 year old how, how do we make it truly intergenerational rather than just cross-generational do you see what i'm trying to say that I, I think i mean there is a place isn't there think of titus 2 for example there is a place for those who are older to teach those who are younger and we've got to really protect that and make sure we value that but but equally that what we're talking about the, the one anothering mm. is kind of almost independent of generations isn't it how, how do we how do we how do we work on that rachel so it's not all one-way traffic I mean, I guess that's a, a spiritual discipline of humility, isn't it? Um, so again, yeah, that's, that's a kind of, you know, it's a kind of church culture thing of growing um, in our understanding of, I haven't made it, I haven't reached the pinnacle and I can learn from others. And if, if the New Testament is full of these one another commands, then it doesn't matter what age or stage I am, I can still learn from other people. Um, mm. And so we just have to kind of, yeah create that and and again that just i think comes through how we preach and teach and just encouraging that kind of idea of you know someone who's ahead of you may have wisdom but actually that's what i find mm -hmm. in most one-to-ones that i do you know i learn loads from the person that i'm meeting with um mm -hmm. it's not it's never yeah. one way yeah. Really. Mm -hmm. yeah. and i think the other thing to see is uh have the word at the center you know if, if you've got the bible if, the, if that is the thing that's bringing you together uh that it's a great leveler isn't it god's word we're both coming to this to learn um yeah and yes we're learning from each other but it's, it's god's word that's right at the heart of this this relationship isn't it we found as well um Keita, who's our, our women's ministry leader did a lot of work on this off the back we preached titus earlier in the year and she started looking for a lot of female students approached her about mentorship and she kind of put that out there and it the words put a lot of an older generation off. They weren't sure whether mm. they were up for it. We just called it right. discipleship partners just to try okay. and get that, that idea of coming to God's word together, to learn together, to share life together. And it kind of just took that mm. out. Mm. Great, Graham, that's really helpful. Um, let me just just push on this subject a little bit more. Um, one, one of the things it seems to me in church life is there's a lot of toleration that goes on between generations. You know, we mm. put up with stuff because we're Christians. Mm. But don't grumble don't complain um i was very struck a few years ago now in fact when i was first starting in ministry someone was saying to me um talking about music which is a slightly different issue but but someone was saying you know actually we don't we don't believe in toleration we believe in you know rejoicing with those who rejoice so he, mm. he said to me in in music when, when you see a, when you sing a kid's song in church that the, that the kids love that's full of good gospel truth toleration is an adult saying i'm going to sing this song um, you know, I'm going to put up with it because, you know, it's good to have some kids in the church. But actually, the, the biblical approach is to say, no, I'm going to enjoy singing this song mm. because it does someone else good. And that seems to me to be quite more profound than just I'm going to put up with stuff, doesn't it? And we, we've got to get beyond that just toleration, haven't we? We've, we've got to get we've got to get into the mindset that actually 
if something if something blesses someone else i'm going to rejoice in that even if it's not what i would first choose yeah i, I think so and it's a daily call to die to self isn't it with this stuff and yeah that's helpful how, how can we put each other first and this yeah this this discipleship thing that we're we're doing uh yeah i think that's that's really helpful to 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 think about how we do that I, i'm in my own times just approaching kind of romans 12 13 14 and, and so much of that section's about outdoing one another when it comes to showing mm. honor isn't it and um how can we how can we seek to to do that in our in our local churches putting each other first um i, I always think i say to people that there's two mindsets that we can come in this door with on a Sunday morning and during the week. Uh, what's in this for me would be one mindset and the other one would be, you know, how can I serve? You know, what, what, yeah. what can I do yeah. and how can I put each other first? And how? And so much of church life is just the first, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. And we can easily just behave like the world with Christian clothes on, can't we? Um, hmm. no, I think that's exactly right. Um, Ray, Rachel, I heard a good talk the other day and um, you might have heard it too. In fact, I think you did because you gave it, um, <laughs> which, <laughs> which was in a, a slightly different context, talking about a different issue, talking about men and women in the church. But I think one of the points you made in it, which I really appreciated, was the importance of um, not just assuming that you know what people think mm. and how they experience things, but asking them questions. Yep. You know, in, in, rather than just assuming that, um, I mean, in the context you were explaining it, uh, you know, a woman's work in the church knows what, you know, rather than just assuming you might know what a wo your woman's work or whoever it is, thinks about this subject why don't you ask her what she thinks mm. about it mm. and i felt that a really helpful rebuke and uh, in fact we met up the week after that and i did ask you some questions <laughs> so i was trying to put it into practice but but that's important isn't it that, that, that actually the value of listening to others mm. in church across generations understanding yeah. their experiences understanding joys and struggles that is really really important and it's a really good biblical principle isn't it yeah yeah because i think that's what's going to help us love one another well and not again make negative assumptions about different generations so we might see a younger generation not doing something that we hold important but unless we ask them why um, mm -hmm. we're not going to be able to either understand or then gently correct if necessary um, and, and know where to go to to bring that correction and help them see what it means to live like Jesus in that area of life um, I think yeah. we can and it's the same with you know kind of words and kind of experiences you know we can think of a certain word means something to us because that's what it meant in our generation but actually the younger generation or even the older generation it means something completely different and so you find that you're cro talking at cross purposes to one another and actually just taking time to listen and go well, what does that mean for you um, but again, like Graham said, it's you know, having then God's word at the center and going, well, actually, that's that's what shapes our understanding yeah. and allows all, all generations to then go, what is good from our generation and how do we celebrate that? But what does God need to shape and change about mm. our generation as well? OK, yeah, that's sick advice, Rachel. And um, everyone, <laughs> <don't> do that. <laughs> everyone, on, everyone under 25 now is going to write in and complain that I'm appropriating uh, their language. And everyone over 25 is going to write in and complain that I shouldn't be saying such things. So we'll, we'll scratch that. Uh, Graham, Gra Gra just as we draw towards the end, th there's, a, there's, a real, there's a real mission opportunity here because um, we as Christians see something beautiful mm. in the way that... Um, uh, church is able to cross over generations in in a way I think that nothing else can yeah. you know there are other things that have a, a a poor reflection of it um in terms of how people get together in different circumstances but there's nothing quite like the church and we've mm. said that's because it's miraculous um so there's a beauty in it to us that we see because scripture helps us to see it the spirit opens our eyes to see it um, but I, th I think that's true evangelistically isn't it it's, a, it's an apologetic for the gospel surely that there's a there's a mission element of a church which is gathering people across generations and i think we've got a wonderful opportunity at this moment in time don't we as, as our world perhaps becomes more polarized in in, in lots mm. of different spheres uh everything that we yearn for as a culture in terms of unity and diversity we, we've got a little foretaste of it in our local churches don't we we, we should yeah. be showcasing what god has done here i think of my my oldest is nine uh, i think of her her generation of friends at school i'm so conscious that out with their organic families they maybe know five other adults 
maybe the their their teacher, maybe their neighbor. That's about it. But mm. our kids come into church and they are met with this family who who love them and for them. I love seeing our kids mix with with other people on a Sunday morning, learning from them, asking with asking about them, laughing with them. I think we've got what this is a wonderful and it always will be. Uh, an apologetic for the gospel, uh, what this this local church is. I remember we had uh, an 80-year-old couple round to watch a movie a few years ago and telling people that, that that's what we did at the weekend. We hung out with an 80-year-old couple, watched uh, Captain Phillips we watched, and people just thought this was the strangest thing. Why on earth would you do that with someone who's not in your family? And yet to us, mm. it's completely... Natural. So I take it this community should be baffling to the watching world. Yeah. Does does baffling, Rachel, also mean? I mean, you know, just to push back on that a little bit. If if it's baffling and it's just odd, how how is that? How is that adorning the gospel to those outside? Just to understand that a bit better. I guess it's maybe baffling to begin with, but as people see it, I think it is a. It's a wonderful thing, and I think it's um, it gives plausibility to the gospel as well because mm-hmm. I think people could understand why to go back to Taylor Swift, many different people might come and gather. I'm glad I'm glad her. we're going back to Taylor Swift. That's but good. in a yeah. sense, it doesn't make sense for people to a degree for you know, like Graham said, to share that. But when you explain to them that's the gospel, it brings a plausibility to it. You're going well. Actually, it's something outside of us that unites us and brings us together. Um, mm-hmm. And I think, again, people are longing for community and longing mm-hmm. for that kind of interaction with people. And if you can show it in a way that is loving and mm-hmm. breaks down those boundaries, then it adds weight to the truth of the gospel because yeah. it doesn't. No, that's helpful. I think you know, it, it's, it's good and right to be like, well, yeah, it doesn't make sense that I'm doing this. But let me tell you why this is the mm-hmm. thing that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. I it's think. like giving a reason for the hope you have. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it, yeah. it sort of prompts those questions, doesn't it? Um, got yeah. A quick fire to end. Um, so I, I, I'm in a church, let's imagine. Um, I, I can see looking out that we're intergenerational physically. I can see the different generations. But spiritually, I know we're not. You know, After the service, when people go for coffee, uh, the older folks sit in one corner. Um, the people who have got kids all the same age, they all get together. Um, you know, the the people perhaps who are younger or, or for whatever reason perhaps um, don't share that same life experience. They're in a different corner and the kids are all together. Mm. So so, um, so my quick fire is wh- where do I start? Where, where can I make a start? Graham and Rachel, I want to ask both the same question. Just give me some counsel. Um, you know, I, I can see what you're saying. I can see the beauty of it. I can see the wonder of it. But I'm slightly overwhelmed with where to even make a start. Mm-hmm. Help me out, Graham. Yep, it's great. Something that we're constantly asking: How can we do this better? I think gospel intentionality. Ha, cr- cross those, cross those barriers. Ask open-ended questions. Uh, learn about other people's lives, their life stages, what they're going through. Uh, I, I think that's that's the the first thing. Be brave with doing it. Just because you don't understand somebody. Uh, it doesn't mean that you can't enter their world just because you've not been through the things that they've been through. Um, gospel intentionality would be my answer. Okay. Rachel, how about you? I mean, I guess it comes back to some of the stuff we've talked about already. I think teach on it, teach the beauty of mm-hmm. the local church um, and use that as a way to illustrate some of that. Be willing to do some awkward things. So have, like Graham said, a name badge Sunday where you then encourage people <laughs> to go and talk to one person who's not like them. People might not like it, but you have to be intentional in breaking down those barriers. You need to create yeah. structures for them to do it. You know, have a have a meal after church and encourage people to sit in different places. Like some of this, you just have to voice out loud to do it. But I think undergirding it with God's word is what's going to help people see the beauty of it, isn't it? Thank you so much, Rachel. And thank you, Graham. There's a little article on our website, Graham, that you've written for us, which is really helpful and thoughtful. Go and read about Jean there. And um, you'll be encouraged by that little story. Uh, We'll put the link in the show notes. We'll also put the link to the book if you're interested. I think um, Jean Twenge, she's not a Christian, but I think she has got some very helpful insights just into understanding um, what goes on. Uh, But actually, I I, I guess this is my parting shot. I I read it thinking, oh, if only you knew what the church can do. (laughs) Um, I I don't know her background. I don't know whether she's, I don't think she's a believer. Um, And I don't know what 
in what her background is at all but um i just read it thinking it's crying out for the gospel yeah this kind of her analysis um which is very i think the analysis is very insightful but yeah. she doesn't really have the answer which is the gospel yeah and how wonderful that we do so thank you graham for joining us thank you rachel for joining us um thank you so much for your time and your wisdom this has been independence if you've enjoyed the podcast do rate and review it because it helps people find it and we'll catch up with you soon thank you very much